Welcome back to the Early Way In Podcast. If you're with us, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel. It helps us out a ton. We're now officially on Apple Music and Spotify, offering you a couple different ways to listen to the podcast. Last week's fights were crap. Our bets were crap. We're looking to make up for it this week with UFC 259. We got Jan Blokowicz versus Israel Adesanya. We got 15 total fights and three title fights total. Yeah, the slump of 2021 continues. I do think that if we just stick to our guns, we'll eventually get back on track. That is gambling. Um, you know, we do have three title fights. We have Peter Yan and Elijah Main Sterling in the 135 pound men's division. Then we have Amanda Nunez versus Megan Anderson at 145 women's. And at 205, like you said, Blakovitz versus Israel Adesanya and easily my most anticipated yeah. championship matchup this year. For sure, man. Uh, I think we're going to give the challenges a break for right now. It's been some bad juju in like the last four fight nights. Uh, we got something in mind that we're going to we're going to throw out there as well, man. So let's go ahead and get into these fights. Yeah, we start off in the men's 135 pound division with five star Trevin Jones, who's 12 and six, taking on eight and one Mario Bautista. Trevin Jones entered the UFC with a bang yeah. and his win over Timur Valiev. Uh, in that fight, you know, it, it seemed like Valiev was having so much success that he kind of got a little too comfortable and uh, lacked a little bit in his defense. And ultimately, Trevin Jones was able to time a right-hand counter uh, to one of Valiev's kicks and really make him pay for it. You know, something I noticed about Trevin Jones is he does like to stand southpaw, and he has a really sneaky left hand from mm -hmm. it. I know re here recently he's been working at Extreme Couture and specifically getting those rounds in with Brandon Moreno, which is a great training partner considering where Trevin has kind of come from, from that regional scene. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely look to make big improvements in this fight. And then on Mario Bautista's side, working with some really good guys down there at the MMA lab. Um, he also had a, a debut against a really tough opponent mm -hmm. in Corey Sandhagen, which uh, as expected, it, it was a first round arm bar. Uh, didn't really get to see much from Bautista, but it is Corey Sandhagen who's about to fight for the belt next. Um, Bautista, as far as his stand up goes, he's really, really good at using feints to set up his combinations. And as we saw in that Miles Johns fight, he's able to stifle a wrestling attack by offering feints up the middle, which was ultimately what put Miles Johns away in that fight. Uh, really impressed with Bautista's striking, and that's probably why we see the swing in in odds in his favor. Yeah, man, absolutely. Trevin, uh, Trevin Jones can only look to build off of that last performance. He earned himself the comeback of the year of 2020 with that. Um, you know, give you one guess at who the ref was that night. Uh, I could only imagine it's Chris Taggio. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> nobody or, you know, every other ref was going to call that. Mm -hmm. um, definitely should have been stopped there. But, you know, he ends up coming back, getting a win, all for it to be overturned for marijuana use. Um, you know, just kind of like the Kevin Kroom, taking on day's notice and then getting punished like that. We, you know, definitely don't agree there, man. Right. Uh, but he's a tough dude. He's shown a ton of heart in that fight. He's never been finished on the feet. And that move to extreme couture, you know, for as guys athletic and fast and powerful as, as he is, mm -hmm. I look for huge improvements to come out of that. Um, you can argue, you know, that, you know, on a full camp, and he's arguing getting a step down in competition here in Mario Bautista. But Bautista has been in the, you know, on the grind with the guys at MMA lab like Casey Kinney and Kyler Phillips. Guys are in camp to fight on this card as well, and that's something you like to see. Mm -hmm. Been one of the public's more popular, you know, um, picks this week as we've seen a more than 100-point shift in his favor. Um, you know, it's getting a little wide, but I, I do agree with him here. I think he's a much better striker on the feet. You talked about the feints and the movement he has. He's got a great body kick and a good right hand in both conventional, um, you know, stance. And then when he switches to southpaw, he's just as dangerous on the feet there. He does offer, you know, a ridiculous pace and pressure that I think is going to cause Trevin um, a lot of problems, especially come late in that fight. But you can't ignore that, you know, the, um, the odds makers open this a whole lot closer than it is now. And Jones will probably make it a pretty close fight. Um, but I do lean Bautista here, and I'm probably going to actually already have parlayed him with someone later on in the night. And, uh, you know, after watching tape study, it's hard not to lean Bautista, especially considering the majority of the fights that we've seen mm -hmm. Bautista in, it's on the feet, and then same with Jones. But we do know that Jones has that uh, mm -hmm. BJJ black belt and is a six-time Nogi champion. So I do think that that's probably where the odds makers are giving him a little bit of support mm -hmm. in the uh, in the plus 110 opening odds. Yeah, for sure, man. This is just one of, you know, 15 fights tonight, and I think they're kicking the night off with an absolute killer fight. 100%. We move on to our second fight of the night in the men's lightweight division between Euros Medic, who's six and zero, taking on Alon Cruz, who is eight and three. 
And Euros Medic is a guy that you and I have been waiting to make that debut since he's showing with the Contender Series. And we're really hoping that he doesn't end up being the uh, the Jordan Wright or the um, Carlton Minus coming out of Alaskan FC because mm-hmm. – you know, Alaskan FC is known to, uh, you know, to basically pad their records of their stars with some easy fights there. And um, He's got a huge frame, man, for 155. It's, it's really hard to see how he makes this weight class. He offers a really good left hand on the feet, and he loves that body kick. Um, and in Alaskan FC, it, it's really obvious even there on the regional scene what these guys' game plans are, and it's to grapple him because his weakness is wrestling. Um, he does offer you some slick submissions off his back, and he actually opened as the dog here and has been steamed to the minus 165 favorite. You know, the public seems to like him just as much as we do. You see Alon Cruz here moving up to his, you know, make his debut at 155. And, uh, I mean, just look at the resume. It's, you know, it's got Carlisle, Damon Blackshear, Steve Garcia, and even, you know, Steve Wynn, who is a contender series vet, but also just got the 30-second knockout in LFA just a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. So, it is leaps and bounds above, you know, who Medich's fault. And it's not like he has, um, you know, doesn't have the frame to go up to lightweight. He's, he's massive as well, has a big reach, but he's used to being that bigger guy. So going up, I think Medich offers him a ton of fight, you know, a ton of problems on the feet. what do you think about this one? Yeah. So if we could have gotten Medich at dog odds, mm-hmm. I think we both would have pulled the trigger. Yeah. But like you said, looking at the Alaskan regional scene and the amount of competition he's faced, um, extremely suspect, and it's hard to put any stock in a 6-0 and record mm-hmm. coming out of them. Um, he's only been to the second round once, which is, like, really concerning, especially considering he's fighting Alon Cruz, who we've seen keep up an output, especially a kicking heavy output, mm-hmm. all three rounds, and uh, impressed me with his cardio, where Medic, from what we've seen, you're right, extremely powerful striking, and having fought all the way up at middleweight in his debut, most of his fights at welterweight, and now at 155, has always been a huge presence inside the octagon, but to his credit, although they're inexperienced, Medic has been fighting really big guys, you know, I think it was Jason Flowers, who was 6'2", whenever he fought him, and Flowers looked like a 185-er. A Viking out there. Yeah, (laughs) and Medic matched him eye to eye, so I really do think that he's going to have the uh, physical presence. I think he's going to be a little bit thicker in there as well. Alon Cruz, like you said, coming up from 145, really not giving up much size and actually has the seven-inch reach advantage in this fight, which is kind of nuts to think about. I do think that the cardio is going to be the biggest factor in here. And not ha- or having not seen Euros Medic out of that first round, mm-hmm. really, um, I kind of lean Cruz here as I'm saying it. I'm, I'm kind of talking myself into it, but he he's very unique in a striking game. His arms are extremely long at a 78 inch reach. Um, he kind of has those Tyson Fury forearms where it's just it, it looks disproportional, and uh, you have to respect his kicking game as well. Um, I, I do think that Euros Medic carries a lot of muscle, and with Alon Cruz being a 145er and having that cardio edge, mm-hmm. I see him dragging this out. If I'm not going to bet Alon Cruz straight up here at Dog Odds, take him after that first round, and I guarantee you get good odds on him. Yeah, man, we're, um, you know, this is definitely a price to pay on a debuting fighter. We're on the fence about doing it, and uh, we're kind of kicking ourselves in the ass over not doing with Ronnie Lawrence last week because mm-hmm. he came out and looked like a minus 300 favorite. It very well could be the same here, but for a, a debuting fighter with so many question marks still around them coming from the regional scene and the cardio, um, I don't know if I can play him at this point myself. Yeah, it's it's going to be a probably a pass for me. But like I said, after that first round, I think Cruz is live. Mm-hmm. Moving on, we go to the women's 115-pound division where we see the Brazilian gangster Liviana Souza, who's 14-2, and two, take on Amanda Limos, who's 8-1-1. Uh, something odd about this, one of the biggest odd shift that we've mm-hmm. seen on the entire card. Souza opened as the minus 215 and is now sitting at the plus 185. And it really, you know, it really makes you question a, a lot of, of what people are seeing. I, I ended up watching tape study on both of these guys and came out of it leaning Lemos just ever so slightly. Right. And uh, I was looking at the odds, hoping that I could get Lemos at, uh, you know, close to pick him or mm-hmm. something like that. When I saw that she was sitting at a minus 225, I really wanted to bet Sosa just yeah. off the principle of it. You know, Sosa is an extremely athletic fighter. And uh, you can tell she's a former soccer player. And her leg kicks, I mean, they're as hard as any girl in that division. Um, Sosa also relies on an overhand right, which she kind of spams and can become somewhat predictable. 
which is where we see a lot of people kind of uh, time it, time it and, and have the ability to counter it. Uh, Sosa also has a judo background, which we've seen her use a couple of times, and you can see it in a lot of trips. If yeah. she can get to the clinch mm -hmm. position, she really likes to rely on the trip to get it to the ground. Limos, you know, debuted at Bantamweight, now at 115. Again, another really athletic fighter. Both of these girls kind of mirroring each other's styles, where Limos also has extremely hard low calf kicks and uh, the ability to switch stances. I think that she's a little bit more decorated on the feet, which is why I think the eye test tells people that Amanda Limos is the A side here. Um, but just given the the value of Sosa at this point, it makes me want to bet her. And overall, I think this fight sitting at under two and a half is like plus two hundred, and that's kind of the spot I'm looking at. Yeah, man, this is a this is one we've talked about a lot because this is a fun fight. It's a sleeper fight, and it has potential to be one of the fight of the nights. Uh, and these girls take home some money. Um, you said it perfectly. These girls marry each other perfectly. Some of their skills, their overhand right, their calf kicks, um, they're they're mirror images of each other. Um, as well as you saw Amanda Limos take the two years off before coming back and showing up at straw weight. You see uh, Souza only fight once, uh, I'm sorry, only fight twice in the calendar year, one time in her UFC tenure. She's not a very active fighter, but even on the regional scene, she's beaten girls like Deanna Bennett. She went a couple, you know, um, you know, I think five rounds split decision there with Angela Hill. Mm -hmm. um, and she's lived up to that Brazilian uh, gangster nickname taken Sarah Frodo when Sarah Frodo came in seven pounds overweight. Um, she's an aggressive girl, and she walks forward just slinging that right hand. Um, you touch on the on the trips. That is this girl's main way of getting the fight to the mat. And when she does, she unleashes some nasty ground and pound on you. On the Amanda Limo side, you know, her whole entire career and fighting Leslie Smith there at Bantamweight, you know, it worked out. But until um, she got to UFC and Leslie Smith was taking some of those punches from her because she's only 5'4 and walking through them, you know, she realized she was way too small. Mm -hmm. She took two years off and she came back and looked great. She's now 2-0 and at straw weight beating Miranda Granger and Mizuki Anu and, you know, the headlock choke that she had on Miranda Granger, Miranda Granger you know, it's evident the strength is still there mm -hmm. even at this, um, even at this weight class here. I think she is the, you know, the sharper boxer here. And I think Sosa is probably going to try to take that Mizuki Anu approach and put her on the cage and, and to take some of those athleticism and skills away. But, you know, to cause this line to flip like this, without a doubt, the, um, it's a dogger pass play on Sosa here. If you want any type of value in this fight, for me personally, I think I'm going to lay off, um, but I do know you're all over that under two and a half. You think one of these girls are going to get finished. Just to reiterate, between the two, there's 17 finishes mm -hmm. and only five decisions. And we're getting two to one, two to one dog odds at this not going to decision. And I, it just appeals to me. I know that when I look at 115 pound girls that I should never be on right. an under, <laughs> but here I am again. I just fall trapped to it. I think both of these girls really have potential to end this early. Yeah, if there is um, the two women in the 15 pound weight class there with finishing ability, I'll give it to you. These are these are the girls. Cool, cool. Moving on, man, to our men's welterweight division. We have Sean Brady, who is 13 and 0, taking on Jake Matthews, who's 17 and 4. Um, Sean Brady is one of the brighter prospects at welterweight here, still sporting his undefeated record, 13-0. and 0, And a guy Paul Felder is extremely high on. Um, and you can't fail to mention one of the meanest bag tests in the game, you know. Uh, he, he's now 3-0 and 0 in the UFC, coming off his first TKO win with the company there over to Christian Aguilera. But a fight that I really, really enjoyed watching of his is that Nardia fight. And it's a fight where he came out and he was outclassed on the feet in the first round, and he mm -hmm. knew it. He dropped the first round. And he comes out there the next two and uses his wrestling, you know, to win the fight. Um, he showed that he's very well-rounded. He's got three TKOs, three submissions on his record. And um, he's got eight takedowns in his three UFC wins. So he's very willing to mix it up to do what he needs to, you know, to win the fight here. They have him listed at 5'10". Nordiev's listed at 5'10 as well. And Nordiev was, uh, looked a good inch and a half, two inches bigger than him. So I, I do question the height, sort of a Rosenstroy kind of situation there. Mm -hmm. Um, hyping Brady up there. On the other side of Jake Matthews, um, you talk about performances that I'm disappointed in, and it's the one over Diego Sanchez. I know you and I bet the under two and a half in that, in that fight and really paid. We, we thought Jake Matthews was going to look a whole lot better and, and, and put an old Diego Sanchez away, and he didn't shoot once. And when he did drop him in third round, there really wasn't a sense of urgency to get him out of there. At 26, there's still time to improve. But I, I hear people talk about he's one of those guys that has his dad in his corner. And he's, un, he's unwilling to change gyms and make some of these changes he needs to, um, to progress his career. 
but at 18 years old, he's fighting guys who are in the UFC right now. So no, you know, no shock that he's in the spot that he is now. He's made the move up to welterweight being six and one, showing that's probably the best move that he's made in his career. I think this fight personally, um, it is closer than how they have it aligned at Brady as a two to one favorite. I think this depends on the Jake Matthews that shows up. Is it going to be the one that was a lackluster Jake Matthews and the Diego Sanchez, or is it going to be the one that shows up to um, has him as 10 and four UFC record? I, okay. So to start off, I'm just as impressed as the next guy of Sean Brady and how he's looked up until this point. I just don't know if the right spot to play him right here is like you said, the two to one dog against a 15 fight UFC veteran with a strong wrestling base and only 26 years old yeah. than Jake Matthews. I agree Jake Matthews has some holes in his game, but similar to, similarly to Tiago Moises, he's young, you yeah. know, he's still filling those holes. And um, it, it does, it is a little disappointing hearing that he, he isn't training at, at some of the better places or some of the places that it would more than likely take him to where he needs to be to be an upper echelon UFC right. talent. Um, but he does have a strong wrestling base. And that's something that Sean Brady looks to uh, implement on his opponents. We've seen him kind of get touched up in that uh, mm -hmm. Nardi fight, like you said. But one thing I'll note about Brady is if you were to just look at him, you would think that because of his build, he'd have cardio issues. Mm -hmm. But like you said, in that second and third round of the Nardi fight, mm -hmm. he really brought the pace. Yeah. He picked up the pace and even uh, had, a, had a higher output in those later rounds. Um, if Brady isn't able to get this on uh, to the ground, I think that this could be, you know, a somewhat sloppy wrestler striking mm -hmm. match. Uh, Sean Brady, he, he's really good at throwing a, a check left hook and a left jab, and he's usually able to stay behind that, but there are times where he allows himself to get backed up against the cage. And Jake Matthews, a good lead uppercut, not a lot that I could say that uh, is good about Jake Matthews' stand-up game, but once again, like Tiago Moises, it's something that he can always uh, improve on because he, he always has the wrestling to fall mm -hmm. back on. I think that this fight could be a whole lot dirtier than what the line uh, is showing us right here. And for me, I, I think I'm just going to lay off of Sean Brady, although I do think he's the A side here. Yeah, you, you probably hate it a little bit. Sean Brady does finish off my parlay with Mario Bautista. Um, both fights that I think they're in good spots to win, but I uh, Without a doubt, you know, you know, 15 fight UFC bet. Jake Matthews is live in this spot for sure. Moving on to the light heavyweight division, we have Carlos Olberg, who's only three and zero, taking on the African Savage. And forgive me, Kennedy Inzechukwu. Inzechukwu. Inzechukwu, who's seven and one. Carlos Olberg, first guy coming out of City Kickboxing on the card. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of unknowns at only 3-0, and and that 3-0 and record is spanning over the course of a decade. Uh, made his debut in 2011 and then has rattled off two wins in the past couple years and is now sitting in the UFC, and it's got me scratching my head why. Thanks to Izzy. Thanks to Izzy. <laughs> yes, that helps a ton. Um, most, of his, most of Carlos Olberg's experience is in the kickboxing ring, although it was only for one night. Um, Olberg isn't just because he trains with Izzy does not mean that he's as good as Izzy. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are putting a lot of stock in him yeah. being just an incredible kickboxer when in reality, similarly to Dominic Reyes, he's an athlete turned fighter. Mm -hmm. um, traditionally a professional rugby player. Uh, Olberg has a lot of uh, holes in his game. You know, we know he has the the striking advantage but even there he's he definitely uses more like timing and power than movement like Izzy does Izzy's got the the, the well-developed game where Olberg is still a little raw on his striking and um really really relies on his uh on his power and length to get the to, to get the job done rather than technique like Izzy where on Kennedy training at a Fortis MMA a two-time contender series alumni. He is two and or one and one in the UFC, but it's some really weird circumstances. In that first fight against Paul Craig, he was touching him up and should have gotten that win before losing in the most Paul Craig way possible. A last second submission, Paul Craig pulls it off. And you know, Kennedy gets an 0 and one record when in reality he should be one and zero. Then in the Darko Stosic fight, 
gets two points taken away in the second and third round from groin kicks and ends up edging out a close decision victory over Darko Stosik that mm. take away the points deductions, he, he definitely lost. This is a tough fight to call. I'm not sure if this is the fight to fade Olberg, but damn, it looks really, really close considering that Olberg is now the two and a half to one favorite over somebody in the UFC. Yeah, he's, he's a new face to the UFC and it's sitting at minus 255. And honestly, it does have fade written in all over it. Mm-hmm. First one of City Kickboxing making the night in. And for him, you know, Izzy was in his corner on the Contender Series and stuff. It's got to be nice to have Izzy not only in camp with you, but also, you know, on the same pay-per-view as you make your first UFC walk. Um, Punched his ticket with a Contender Series win over 36-year-old Bruno Oliveira. And then you touched about the kickboxing, you know, being an all-one night against some pretty low-level caliber competition there. This guy's made the walk to fight four times here. Not something you're looking for when no one's going to back a fighter. On the feet, like you said, way more stationary than Izzy, but he does show good qualities of a kickboxer. He's, he feints good. He's got the good teeth kick. He's got a good counter left hand that he likes, and he does he throws mean leg kicks, which we saw Dar- uh, Darko Stosik have some success with in the, the Kennedy fight there. One thing about Olberg, and, you know, just like Izzy, though, you know, weighed in at 203 for his contender series fight, and – Kennedy is somebody that easily cuts to 205. He's a big dude, and that's why the UFC is so hype about him. You know, just look at him. He's a physical specimen, trains out of the great gym like you touched on, and UFC was pretty much hoping he was part of that Nigerian wave with Israel and with Kamara Usman, Sadiq Yusuf, but he's um, not really proven to be on, you know, that quite a tier. But, uh, you know, he was rushed to the contender series the first time for his third professional fight. So, mm-hmm. you know, this guy's still got a ton of room to grow. He's still so green. He offers a mean jab, good knees up the middle. Uh, he's got a good kick from his southpaw stance. Um, you know, in the Paul Craig fight, uh, Saif Saud was literally screaming for him to get off the mat with Paul Craig. So it, it is Paul Craig, but it worries me that maybe Kennedy doesn't have the grappling approach or grappling technique to maybe – be the one to expose Olberg who just put his second stripe on his white belt in December. Or even the fight IQ, right? Right. So on the feet, it really is hard to to think that Kennedy has better striking than Carlos because he doesn't, but he could be the more complete MMA fighter. Mm-hmm. And it's sitting at plus 215 with twice the fight experience. And it's, it's, it's hard not to take a shot on the dog there. Not to mention somebody who's, I guess the closest in the weight division to John Jones is, yeah. uh, physical attributes six foot five and an 83 inch reach is just absurd and to have a six inch reach advantage over somebody in Carlos Olberg who relies on a striking it makes it makes me think that Kennedy's very playable not, definitely not one that I'm backing like hard or anything right. but just valuable right now yeah the one knock I have on him is uh, I said he lacks that um, that killer instinct but mm-hmm. man if, if they can teach that guy to, to flip that switch he could become a real problem he's got all the physical attributes yeah. to be an absolute monster in that division taking a step down back to our men's bantamweight division we have Tim Elliott who is 16 and 11 taking on Jordan Espinosa who's 15 and 8 and social media handle there for Tim Elliott awkward MMA describes that dude perfectly um Somewhat of like a poor man's Dominic Cruz in his movement, you know, uh, throws that crazy up kick, puts on a relentless pace as far as getting that takedown. But, you know, there's a method to this guy's madness that's made him a top flyweight in the world for a quite some time there. He UFC run the first time, not really, didn't go so well. But on the regional scene, bounces his way back, wins the uh, Titan FC belt. Gets another shot on the tough and wins the damn thing, you know. Mm-hmm. And you know you've got to fail to you can't fail to mention that the first round with DJ he had a tight guillotine locked up there. He's um, kind of lives and dies by the scrambles that he creates there. He kind of leaves his neck out to be submitted sometimes, but he's also great at locking up submissions there himself. He's got good dirty boxing, and I lean toward him in the cardio edge. On Jordan Espinosa's side, it you know. Kind of resembles Tim Elliott a little bit as far as living and dying by the wrestling. You know, he's going to get the fight there. He's going to a lot of times uh, submit you, and he makes the same mistakes in getting submitted himself. He's a lot more athletic, I think, than Tim Elliott is, and I'm curious to see how the wrestling's going to match up. And and pure strength wise, I'm I'm curious to see if Jordan's going to be able to stop some of those takedowns of Elliott. Uh, yeah, Elliot, you know, whenever you see double digit losses, it's it's a huge turnoff for me. Um, al- although I do think that Elliot's at a playable position right here. You know, he's training at a glory MMA with James Krause. And when I look at his record, 
his wins aren't aren't that impressive. Yeah. You know, I, I go through them after his his second appearance in the UFC. His wins are over Luis Smolka, who's no longer in that weight class. Mark De La Rosa, who's no longer in the UFC, and Ryan Benoit, who's scheduled to fight Zachary Adeshev for his UFC contract. Pink slip contention, right? Yes. There. <laughs> so you know, really, what can you draw from Tim Elliott? Well. From his losses, at least they're to the highest, the, the best guys that the division has to offer. And Elliot, you know, really, really good at his uh, at his wrestling heavy attack and not getting worn down because of that attack. You mentioned his gas tank, and that's something where I do think that he'll have uh, the extreme advantage over Espinoza. Like you said, Espinoza also likes to rely on his wrestling. And I do think that he'll be the more athletic guy here. I just don't think that he has the technical advantage in the mm-hmm. grappling. And that'll end up being his uh, Achilles heel in this fight. Um, one of the fights that I like to take away from Espinosa is the Alex Perez fight, where the first shot that Alex Perez uh, tried, he, he ended up double-legging Espinosa with relative ease mm-hmm. and then finishing him with an arm triangle choke in half guard. And I, I just really question whether or not Espinosa has the defensive grappling mm-hmm. having four of his eight losses by submission to ward off Tim Elliott's uh, sub attempts. I do think that Elliott's going to be able to get this to the ground. And even if it is on the feet, I do think that Elliott has developed a striking game to to work with his wrestling. It's not that it's like fully developed, but he did establish a jab in that Ryan Benoit fight mm-hmm. that that put me on uh, on notice that Elliot's made improvements in his striking. Um, I, I definitely lean towards Elliot, but it's not like a, a huge play for me. I, I think that we could take him with relative confidence now that he's sitting at an underdog. Yeah, it's much like the, you know, the Lavinia Sosa fight where, you know, Elliot opened as a minus 130 and has now been flipped to the dog. So keep the bookies on us there. I don't hate it. Um, I'm curious to see who the better wrestler is between the two, but, uh, you know, I, I was going in leaning Tim Elliott. I came out wanting to still bet Tim Elliott at dog odds. I, I probably will play that myself there. Espinoza, I just don't see the improvements in the guy I like to make or that I like to see in a guy. Um, he trains out of Latrell's MMA, looking through the Instagram. I don't really see anybody training with him, you mm-hmm. know, that's um, of note there. He tends to get his back stuck on the fence. And when Tim Elliott was someone who, you know, relentlessly pursues that takedown, not a good habit. Um, probably a small play, man, but I'm going to go with the Tim Elliott on the veteran there. I like it. Moving on through the card, our next matchup is in the men's flyweight division between Kai Carr of France, who's 21 and nine, taking on Rogerio Bontarin, who is 16 and two. The second guy out of city kickboxing making the walk there on Saturday night. He's a very experienced flyweight who got the UFC attention, man, starching guys on the regional scene. And the trend continued in that first fight of Ultimate Fighter season with this big overhand right uh, knockout over Terrence Mitchell. Um, You know, his run came to an end uh, with the loss to Pantoja there. But, you know, Pantoja not only was the number one seed in that, uh, you know, in that season there, the Ultimate Fighter, but he's a top flyweight in the world right Mm -hmm. now as well. Kai Carr France put a couple wins together. Uh, climbed his way back to the UFC where he's now four and two with those two losses coming to Moreno and Roy Val with maybe round of the year between the, with him and Roy Val. Mm-hmm. He's got good kickboxing Muay Thai, but he does have a little bit of a small frame for that division and he can get bullied and backed up against the fence with grappling ultimately being his kryptonite there. Uh, on the side of Bontarin, he is coming back from a year layoff from a little nagging ankle injury his last fight, he did drop his, um, you know, his first decision loss there, but it was, or I'm sorry, first UFC loss, but it's to Ray Borg who notoriously missed weight yet again. And Borg's a, you know, a guy that's missed weight at 35. He's a massive flyweight and was a, basically just a better wrestler that night. But then we touch on his debut with Bibliotov as well, who also missed weight. So this guy is, you know, not even gotten a fair shake in the UFC so far. He is, his strengths lie in the ground game. He's good on top. He's got great sweep. He got seven submission wins. This guy's a BJJ black belt. His chin seems to be unreal. He's able to walk through some shots to walk you down and land his heavy right. I um, you know, I don't see him being any more outclassed um, here on the feet than he was against Bibliotov, who offers all kind of spinning attacks at you. Um, and I think there's a clear path for Bontrin to be able to back Kai Car France up against the fence and I actually went in wanting to bet Kayakar France, and I, and I came out seeing the path to victory here for Bontrin, and I've made a slight dog play, but one that I think we uh, we might disagree on here. Yeah, so Bontrin definitely seems to be one of the most 
live dogs on mm-hmm. the card. Maybe not live in my opinion, but one of the most played dogs yeah. on the card. And with 11 of his 16 wins by submission, there's really no question what his game plan is. I compared him to somebody we recently saw, Rodolfo Vieira, where his wrestling may be not the most technical, Mm -hmm. but he's strong enough that if he wants to get it to the ground, he's really had no problem doing that. Plantation strength like Figgy. Exactly. Uh, Rogerio, big puncher, has a lot of power, especially in that lead left hook. Mm -hmm. Um, but he does have a tendency to kind of overextend and leave that chin exposed, which is where I think Kai Kara France can capitalize here. Um, Kai has really shown a well-rounded striking game, and it's expected coming out of city kickboxing, but not similar to Izzy or to Carlos Olberg. Kai Kara France at only five foot four really doesn't have those physical advantages to lean back on yeah. like the other guys from city yeah. kickboxing do. Um one thing to note is Kai Kara France has never been an underdog in the UFC, but has lost twice. And I think that that's why we see a lot of people wanting to fade him here. It's because they've probably lost money on it. Yeah. And so I really do think it, Kai Kara France at a minus 140 right now, definitely a playable range. At minus 205, I definitely would have had my, I would have been hesitant to try and lay a price tag on him. But as this line cre- creeps closer and closer and closer, I really do think Kai Kara France is going to be able to hold his own. And him being part of the New Zealand national uh, wrestling team and having a 90% takedown defense, I do think that he's going to have uh, enough of a wrestling base to, to ward off Rogerio's attempts to get it to the ground and end up just touching him up on the feet, similarly to Alex Caceres and Kevin Kroon last week. Yeah, I wish I would have got that plus 75 for Bonter. And um, I definitely, you know, I agree with where it is now. This fight is much closer to a pick em and one of many uh, flyweight bouts on the night. Yeah. Uh, moving on, we go to another flyweight bout with Joseph Benavidez who's 28 and 7 taking on Asker Askarov who's 13 0 and 1 not to be confused with Asker Asker <laughs> um, Joe Benavidez you know always comes up short when fighting for the belt uh, I think right now at his career you really got to ask yourself you know where is his headspace you know he's lost in such devastating fashions recently um that you just don't know if at at 36 years old, if he can take that type of damage, you know, just going back to his last two fights against Figueredo, he suffered multiple concussions in those fights, you know, and um, man, 125 is the last division where you want your age to catch up to you and then also have durability issues. It's not that Joseph Benavides has really been chinny uh, in the past. You just can't look past it. It's like Tony Ferguson. I mean, I guess, (laughs) <laughs> he showed some chinniness, but he had never been knocked out yeah. until until recently. And I, I just there's a there's going to be a decline, and I think yeah. a steady decline here. Um, Asker Askarov only real blemish on his record is when he debuted against Brandon Moreno, and in my opinion, was kind of handed that victory. Um, it's it's a, a draw. It's a draw. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so a draw on his on his record, but in my opinion, Brandon Moreno ended up edging that out. Just to keep a zero there on him. I think yeah. so. Um, Askarov, you know, he did start to wear down in that third round, and we saw the cardio issues start to become a problem. Um, being from Dagestan, Russia, he's similar to Khabib, where really all he wants to do is get it to the ground. And when it comes to to Askarov's like mentality, it doesn't really matter if you're able to stuff his first or second or third takedown. As long as he can get on the inside and close the distance and make you work, he's getting off his game plan. I lean towards Askarov here. I sure as hell wish I would have gotten him when he opened up at dog odds. I still have Askarov here and at minus 120, he's, he's playable. For sure, man. Benavidez is in a tough, tough spot at 36 years old. You you don't really expect to see improvements at this age. And from what we've seen, it looks to be on the decline. You talk about coming up short. This guy's had like three or four unsuccessful attempts at capturing that flyweight belt. And it's weird to see that seven losses just come to four people on his record. So he is, um, you know, multiple attempts at fighting those top contenders. And he just, you know, he can't get over that next uh, hump there. Benavidez offers you a ton of volume on the feet, though, man. He really makes you fight on your back foot, and he's never just throwing one punch at you. Um, I know he's probably happy for, uh, you know, 15 round. Joe can happily go 25 without any kind of issues. He has a great kicking game, and he is one of the toughest SOBs I've ever seen fighting out of some of those submission attempts that Figgy had on him. Mm -hmm. But, you know, 
his style of volume is it's really sloppy to me. He does this thing where he rushes forward and at you, throwing hooks, throwing multiple punches at you. But the striking defense, while he does that, it's really it's really bad. And people have really started to time in. And Figgy was able to sit him down. And like you said, multiple concussions there, yeah. you know, multiple <laughs> occasions was able to sit him down. And I said he was able to, you know, just meet him like Justin Gaethje style. You know, when he blitzed him, you know, he didn't fight on his back foot. Figgy planted his feet and threw at him. Um, and I feel like that's the way you beat Joseph Benavidez. With Askar Askarov, that's a guy that I'm really, really excited for. I think he offers a ton for the division. He's the ACBX flyweight champ who vacated his, um, you know, title there to get a shot. And, I, I, you know, debuting against Moreno is a tall task. And I, I do think you're right. I do lean to Moreno. I think he won that fight there. But he's since been Tim Elliott and Pantoja. He's still searching, man, for that first UFC finish. He does have the 100% finish rate outside the UFC. And I think this is relatively a good fight for him to maybe see um, his first finish in the UFC. I compare Askarov to Masvidal or Evolev, you know, in his relentless pursuit on a takedown. But just he doesn't care if you, you know, jump the guillotine on me, you know. Um, hip toss me like Tim Elliott you know, the fight's going to the ground and that's where he lives for. He's always going to end up in the more dominant position. And at 28, I see him improving every single fight. His hands to me look better every fight. Um, Is he I, playable at minus 120? I do think he's playable at minus 120. Um, and I also like the inside the distance of plus 450, which is something that I uh, will probably take a slight stab on as well. Um, I think Askarov is one of my more confident picks on the night. You know, I, I didn't know about the inside the distance prop, but that definitely appeals more to me than than betting Askarov straight. Um, you know, we've already brought into question Joseph Benavidez's durability right now. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, plus four, whatever you just yeah. said, that sounds interesting to me. Absolutely. We move on to the men's bantamweight division where we see Kyler Phillips, who's eight and one, take on Song Yudong, who's 16, four and one. Kyler seems to be one of the public's, you know, more popular underdogs this week. I feel like I see everybody and their mom on Kyler Phillips. Um, he does train out of the MMA lab, like we've talked about, training with guys like Bautisto, Mally, uh, Casey Kinney. He was on season one of Dana White's Contender Series. Uh, he did get the win, but he did not get the contract. He did get a shot on the Ultimate Fighter, where he was eventually turned away by the eventual winner there in Brad Katona. Um, and that is something to note that that was actually up a weight class from where Kyler Phillips is right now. He's a guy, uh, BJJ black belt. He's good on top with great submissions and he's developed a good kicking game with that's pretty evident with some of the guys that he's been training with there. He debuted against Gabriel Silva and then most recently dispatched of the short notice replacement and Cameron else. Um, you know, Cameron else opponents record of like six, I'm sorry, eight and 16. And, uh, you know, you got me with Mike Grundy, but, um, if there is another Brit that can wrestle, you know, throw it in the comments and prove me wrong because, you know, there are not a lot of British fighters that have any type of uh, wrestling background. And in my opinion, um, you know, neither one of those fighters or anything like Song Yudong. He entered the UFC at 20. You know, he's now seen five victories in a uh, draw against Cody Stamen. A couple arguable, you know, decisions on his record there, but he does train out of Team Alpha Male. You see Uriah Faber say that he's the future of the division. And at 23 years old, this is about to be the guy's 22nd professional fight. So he's really, really experienced. He's got four bonuses in the sixth fight. So Song is a very, very exciting fighter. This is a sleeper fight right here for fight of the night. He does good combinations, and he's got some of the fastest hands in the division. Um, he's opened as another massive favorite here again, just like a lot of his previous fights. And, um, you know, Ben Steen down. I'm on the Song Yudong side, uh, which has looked to me like the unpopular side here. What do you think? Yeah, I think Song Yadong, it, it's kind of hard to to back him as a favorite yet again, where in his last two fights, he was sitting at the minus 250, and I think he lost both of them. Yeah. Um, you know, you touched on him being only 23 years old now. Um, been a pro since 15 years old. I mean, you can't ask for much more experience than that. That's just some Chinese bullshit right there, <laughs> if you ask me. Um, Song Yadong, man, whenever I watched his tape study, his hands are insane, yeah. like crisp boxing combinations, insane hand speed, um, and really just been a little a step ahead of his competition up until this point. Um, on the Kyler Phillips side, you know, you want to talk about experience. He, like you said, a BJJ black belt, but has been training BJJ since he was three years old, mm -hmm. according to his dad. 
um, also extremely athletic in his movements and has a really creative, creative striking arsenal. I do think that, that Kyler Phillips traditional wrestling is a little bit better than Song Yadong's, although I don't think that it'll play much of a factor in this fight. Song Yadong has insanely good sprawls Mm -hmm. and you definitely don't want somebody like Song Yadong with that type of speed and power on top of you. So I doubt Phillips is going to be shooting much. I do think that this is similar to the Souza Limos fight earlier in the night where both of these guys' styles really mirror each other. And I do understand why it's tempting to take Kyler Phillips at, at dog odds mm-hmm. right now. As it gets closer to a pick it makes me want to play Song Yadong a little bit harder. Although I, I do think that the, the play here, again, is the under. I think the minus, or under two and a half is minus one, or plus 155. And because both these guys throw with so much power and I do think it's just going to be a stand-up war where their wrestling kind of cancels each other out I do think that there's some value on the under on this one yeah I do uh there's definitely value on the under there um and that's sitting at plus 150 plus 160 it's something that we're probably going to look at um I do lean to bet Song Dong straight here as opening as a minus 190 I think he's a better fighter here Kyler Phillips is not really ever been some guy that I've just been overly high on for some reason, but at the same time, it's hard to back somebody like Song Yudong who's shown the cardio issues that he has. You can you can really argue that he lost those fights because of round three with Cody Stamen and with uh, Cheeto Vera. He gave up the third rounds to the wrestling where he didn't have the gas tank. Um, and come that third round, you know, I think there could potentially be a good life bet opportunity there on Kyler Phillips. Um, something maybe to take note. Yeah, for sure. We Moving move on, on, actually, to our prelim uh, prelim main event here. We see Dominic Cruz on the prelims. He's 22-3, and three, taking on Casey Kinney, who is 16-2-1. This takes place in our men's bantamweight division. Um, it's a one that we've been talking about all week. Go ahead, man. Yeah, definitely not used to seeing Dominic Cruz on the prelims. Mm-hmm. And according to him, if you've heard his recent interviews, that's the best spot on the card. And he thinks that he chose himself <laughs> to be there. I'm not a huge fan of Dominic Cruz's personality, but I will admit that as far as the Bantamweight division goes and its limited amount that yeah. it's been here, he's probably the GOAT. Um, as of right now, he's on a two-fight skid. And it's spanning over the course of four years. You know, it, it's literally been a half a decade since his last win. And at 35 years old, I really do think his best days are behind him. You know, we saw in his last fight against Cejudo him come out and have some success. You know, I think that he lost the first round to Cejudo, but that's because he just didn't have an answer to the powerful leg kicks that Cejudo throws. That's something where Casey Kenny actually shines yeah. and something that I – would recommend Casey Kenny investing in early. Yeah. Something that Dominic Cruz relies on a whole lot is his movement and footwork. Mm-hmm. And if Casey Kenny isn't trying to slow that down, I think it could be a really long night for him. You know, it's it's kind of odd because last year, if you were to tell me Casey Kenny and Cruz were fighting, and you were to tell me that Casey Kenny's the favorite, mm-hmm. I'd laugh at you. Yeah. Um, but I guess because of his win over Nathaniel Wood, which was really a, a hard-fought battle, and one that, you know, I wouldn't come off of that win and think that he's going to beat somebody like Dominic Cruz. Yeah. Um, you know, Casey Kenny, he's shown that he has the cardio to throw for three rounds. We saw that in the Alatang fight mm-hmm. where he more or less just had a human punching bag for 15 <laughs> minutes. Um, but he looked awesome. And Kenny does, you know, have a well-rounded game being a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. He could give Dom some trouble, especially if Dom looks a step slower at 35 years old and and not having success recently in, in MMA. I do think that there's like some unknowns and some potentials for Dom to let us down. But if it if the even 75% of the dominant crews we know is mm-hmm. there shows up on Saturday, I think that he'll take this fight. Yeah, man. It's a uh... It's a tricky spot for Dominic Cruz, and it's a tricky fight here. Uh, him and Casey are at two different points in their career. And, yes, I guess if you had to pick a Bantamweight, I guess he's the best one out there. But it is, it's a far stretch for me to call this guy the GOAT. Not, you know, I, uh, again, not the biggest fan of Cruz myself, but this guy's had seven UFC fights, which is – that's crazy to think about, you know, for as long as he's been around. Casey Kinney has one less UFC fight than Dominic Cruz has. And then – on that, on top of that, his wins over Benavidez and McCall Demetrius Johnson. I mean, those are flyweights, 
And then, you know, Cejudo, your flyweight champ, and the last fight Cody was scheduled was at flyweight. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm quick to call him the Bantamweight goat here. This guy's also had a ton, a ton of injuries. You know, it was the ACLs, then it's the broken arm, then the shoulder. Um, I like to see consistency, and that's just something Dominic Cruz has not had over his career. But his movement, you know, his head movement, his footwork, it, it's – there's no one like him in the UFC, man. He throws from very uh, awkward angles, and he's going to be, you know, he's not a stationary target. He's not going to be there to hit like Alatang was for him. And he does, you know, he shows very smart IQ in there when it comes to his wrestling as well. Um, he's one of the smartest guys on the roster, and I, and I, I hate to just, you know, down him, downplay him, but uh, he is in a tough spot here with Kenny. Um, he's really kind of, you know, there's a lot to gain for Kenny here and a lot to lose for Cruz. Cruz doesn't really gain much with a win over Casey Kenny here. Um, and, you know, when a win for Casey Kenny puts him in, you know, the top 10 of the division. And he's also on the card. Casey Kenny is also on the card with Megan Anderson, who he made quite the comment about there on, the, uh, on O'Malley's podcast. Um, Casey Kenny is a guy that I'm high on. And I, I did know these tough bantamweight matchups were looming his way as, you know, as stacked as that weight class is. I, you know, with all the injuries and the age, I see why people are backing Kenny, but I feel like we might regret if we don't pull the trigger on a dog here um, who's proven he's world-class caliber when he shows up in the ring um, and the people that he loses to are people that I think Casey Kenny also loses to. Marab, and he outclassed Casey Kenny everywhere, and I put Dominic Cruz on that type of level. Um, I, I, I think I've already – I'd have to look through, but I think I've already bet Dominic Cruz a little bit um, at dog odds. Man, it's hard not to bet the vet. Uh, yeah, man. Cruz, it's it's like he's the Tony Romo of MMA, right? Yeah. His analysis is far better than anybody else, in my opinion. And he kind of knows what's going to happen, yeah. moves ahead of time. It's just, can his body work as quickly as his mind mm -hmm. does in the octagon? And just how much is, is experience going to play a factor in this? Casey Kenny, as far as activity, you know, Kenny is 12-2-1 since Cruz last won his or won his last fight. That's insane. I mean, since 2019, Casey Kenny's had seven fights. That's the amount of fights Cruz has had since 2011. Makes I mean, uh, realistically, the momentum's in Casey's corner. I just don't think that the skill set's in his corner. Yeah, man, I could see Dominic Cruz timing up the takedown and really utilizing that wrestling to, uh, to etch him out a decision win here. I like it. Kicking off the main card, we go to the men's light heavyweight division, the only light heavyweight division, right. with Tiago Santos, who's 21-8, and eight, taking on Alexander Rakic, who's 13-2. and two. Tiago Santos coming off a two-fight skid to both John Jones and Glover Teixeira. And after that last fight, I really pull into question whether or not he's a legit black belt. You know, he has 21 <laughs> wins and only one win by submission, and he's a Brazilian. I got some questions, you know. I... Uh, you know, he he had difficulty stuffing the takedowns of a 6'2", 41-year-old in Glover. Rocked Glover as well. Yeah, a, a compromised yeah. Glover, for sure. And now he's got a 6'4", 29-year-old who's in his prime in Alexander Rakic. And I just don't think that he, he has it in him anymore. Tiago Santos is 37 years old. And after that Jones loss in 2019, he tore everything there is to tear in his yep. knees and literally had to learn to walk again. And I really, I really question the, you know, if Santos is there anymore. Um, to be honest with you, I think Glover Teixeira is a, is a, a tailor-made opponent for Santos to knock out. He just yeah. couldn't get it done. Yeah. And then you, you move over to Rochich. You know, his only, his only loss is, is, is uh, since his pro debut is to Vulcan Uzdemir. And even that one's a really questionable one. Um, and, and thankfully, right after that, when he fought uh, Anthony Smith, he, he showed us that that was a fluke, if anything. Um, what Vulcan Uzdemir had success with, with the calf kicks, Rakic immediately put into his game plan and absolutely mm -hmm. chopped down Anthony Smith. Um, to me, Rakic is the dark, dark horse of this division and opening as a minus 265 and then getting disrespected, in my opinion, yeah. and is now at a minus 150. Rakic is looking to be one of our bigger plays. For sure, man. Uh, with Santos, he is the last man we got a note to currently beat, um, you know, the champion in Jan Blockowitz. Mm -hmm. And he's also the guy that I did tell you for a long time offered John Jones a lot of problems, you know with the calf kicks, um, you know, the power that he brought on the feet. John just hadn't saw that in D.C. 
um, you know, in um, Inca, some people mm-hmm. like that. He hadn't seen that in a while. Santos, though, man, you know, at 37 and those knee injuries, um, you know, and not being able to put Glover away, it really does make, uh, you know, it raises a lot of questions for me as well, man. Um, he's really dangerous in round one, and that's really about it. He's shown to kind of fade after that. He switches stances really well, and he throws the body kick from both stances. I mean, Manawai and Lionheart both were tore up by it from South Paul, and he, you know, made, literally made Eric Anders quit in fetal position with it, you know, in his orthodox stance. He's a huge middleweight, but he's a small, light heavyweight, you know. He's, there's not really that weight class for him. And Rackage, like you talked about, is, is going to be a fucking problem in this division, dude, at 6'4", 78-inch reach. Yes, outs, I mean, the judges rate, you know, they weighed those calf kicks way too much because outside of every other aspect of that, I thought Alexander won that fight against Osmir and should make him 6-0 and in that division here. He switches stance or switches stance just as well, and he has, you know, maybe it's the second hardest kicks behind Santos. You know, he uh, he fights well going backwards with his counter left hook, um, and, you know, I, I, can't, I can't say I'm not worried about Santos, you know, ability to maybe wear out the lead leg of Rakic, but I'm also very well aware that Rakic is able to mix up his game much better uh, and offer the takedowns when he needs. He's much younger, faster, you know, athletic, and I feel like he's just as dangerous on the feet as Santos is. And opening at a minus 165 to get minus 150, dropping a couple units right there for sure. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, we talked about Rakic um, – in his, in his bout against Jimmy Manawa is one that I like to bring up because it is a common opponent. What Rakic was able to do to Jimmy Manawa is what Tiago Santos wishes he could have yeah. done. Santos was, you know, uh, touched up a couple of yeah. times. I don't know if he was actually dropped, but I do know he was rocked at least a few times. And um, if you're going to get into a, a standing war with Alexander Rakic right now, sitting under 30 years old in his prime, I just don't think it's the right move for Tiago Santos, who in my opinion here – has a puncher's chance, and that's mm-hmm. kind of where his his path to victory ends. Yeah, so we d- we're definitely leaning toward Rakic as one of the more confident players on the night. Mm-hmm. We take a step down in divisions here, moving on with Islam Makashev, who is eight and one. I'm sorry, eighteen and one, taking on Drew Dober, who is twenty three and nine. And Islam's basically known as uh, the hair, you know, to Khabib Nurmagomedov. There, he's a super bright pos- prospect at one fifty five. But unlike Khabib, he had the one slip up where he got countered on the feet and he did have the O taken away. But, um, you know, and like Khabib, though, very inconsistent in fighting due to the religion, you know, and, and that caused a slow climb through the rankings here. Islam has been a massive favorite in every one of his, um, you know, every single one of his UFC showings, and it's rightfully so. This guy has a really good body kick at range. He leads with a powerful left hook, and when this guy gets you in the clinch, you know, you're going down to the mat. Win or lose, you know, I, I, I do say that Drew Dober might have seen the better UFC competition, um, but it, but neither one of them have, you know, really taken that step up to the, you know, the upper level yet. Drew Dober, um, it's kind of hit sort of like a second wind in his, you know, in his career so far. This guy's amateur as well. He's, his career spans almost 50 fights. And he's finally put together a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a run. He's won six of his last seven. And that one loss being to Benel Dairouche, who is not looking like a bad loss at the present moment. He trains at a team elevation where you expect the cardio to be good. But Dober does carry a lot of muscle. And come round three, things do get a little bit interesting. But when I see this fight, man, I see that Drew Dober has been submitted multiple times by guys who are far worse grapplers than Islam. Um, but at the same time, Islam, he, he sometimes likes to make fights a lot closer than he, than he needs to make them. If he takes his, um, you know, goes to the wrestling roots, it should be an easy night for him, man. Yeah, at 155 and Drew Dober being only five foot eight, it's kind of weird to think that he has fought at welterweight yeah. before. But you're right, he is just a ball of muscle. And you can kind of see that um, in his calf muscle specifically. Yeah. You can tell he's a toe walker. <laughs> you know, I definitely wouldn't want to be kicked by him by any means. Yeah. But I, I do think that Dober, um, he does kind of rely on his strength. Uh, he, he's got really good Muay Thai. I don't know if uh, you mentioned it, but he is a, a two time champion. And, uh, he, he doesn't have great takedown defense, but he is strong enough and explosive enough to get himself to the feet. But, I mean, I would, it's, I'd be hard-pressed to not bring up the Alexander Hernandez fight where he got taken down in that finishing sequence yeah. multiple times. 
I don't know if that was, um, you know, like inexperienced trying to finish the fight or if that was just poor takedown defense, yeah. but neither one of those things make me want to bet him against somebody like Islam Makachev. To me, I think Makachev is really, really good at, at make, playing his own game. You know, he sets the pace for his mm -hmm. fights. And if you're not going to be the first person to engage with him, he'll more than happily point fight you to a, to a win, which is where I think you kind of are getting that he has him a whole lot closer than maybe yeah. he needs to, but he knows that he's winning the rounds and I think he's okay with that. Um, one, one thing that I've kind of noted is Islam is really good defensively. Whenever it comes to striking, he'll extend his hands out, which in theory isn't the best defense, but he also uh, partners that with movement and circling outside of it. So it really like stops the forward pressure of any opponent that is trying to rush him and, and, you know, mess up the rhythm that Islam's kind of set. The biggest thing I've noted is Dober is defensively sound, but he doesn't really offer any specialty that would disrupt Islam's game plan. And in this scenario, I think that Dober is just going to be one step behind Islam pretty much the entire fight, um, which makes Islam to me a decent parlay piece. And if he keeps, if his line keeps going down and we can get him at minus 300 or better, like yeah. that's definitely somebody I'd be interested in playing. Yeah. He's a, he's a parlay piece for me as well. You know, Drew Dober, he um, he does have the the type of power, I guess, and Muay Thai experience to be able to end this fight with one, you know, with one shot. But Islam Makashev is not a guy that you're going to methodically break down over three rounds. He's too stoic. He's got too you know too much uh, smarts there in the octagon. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, DC is quoted by saying, you know, pure wrestling. This guy will will out wrestle Khabib. He's the best wrestler in the room. Any room he walks in, um, and that's something I like to see. Um, easy path to victory here for him. I actually uh, want to parlay him, but uh, I haven't checked the line, but man, a Makachev by submission is, is something that I might take a look at as well. I don't mind that. First of three title fights on the night, we have Peter No Mercy Jan, who's 15 and one, taking on the funk master Aljamain Sterling, who's 19 and three. Peter Jan, his boxing is probably second to none. Yeah. Um, he really enjoys trading inside the pocket. And I really do think that that's where this fight is won for Peter Jan. Aljo Sterling, I think that he probably has the, the grappling edge here. Mm -hmm. And I'll strictly give him that because of his submission threat when he does get it to the ground. I think Peter Jan, at only 5'7", with a 67-inch reach, he does really, really well mm -hmm. utilizing his technical striking and not really relying on any type of physical advantages to get it done, which is why it's that much more mm -hmm. impressive. Um, you know, Peter Jan, another thing is I think that his defensive wrestling here is going to be enough to uh, to stop the, mm -hmm. the Sterling takedown pressure. You know, Aldo's talked about he only needs one, I don't think that he's going to get that one. Yeah. Um, and I do think that Aljo is going to be looking, looking to his corner for, for a different game plan whenever he can't get this to the ground because Peter Jan's going to be there all five rounds. Mm -hmm. You know, as we saw in the Jose Aldo fight, which he did get touched up a little bit more than I would have liked, he did show that he can go that entire five rounds. It, it's nothing new to him. Um, like, like I said, if, if you've seen any of the promos that Peter Jan's been in up until this point, you know he means business. This yeah. isn't a fight that he's going to be very friendly with. And I could definitely see it, see him having the same intensity as he did in the Uriah Faber fight where he lands a couple, he's throwing up his hands, kind of making Aljo uh, second guess everything that he's prepared for this fight. Showing no mercy. No mercy. And uh, to touch on Aljamain, you know, when it is standing, there's a stat that MMA by the numbers put out that I, I have to throw in here. He's landed 803 strikes in his UFC career, which is the most by anyone in the UFC with zero knockdowns. You cannot say the same for Peter Jan. Right. Peter Jan has rocks in his hand. Yeah. And I really do think that, uh, <laughs> you know, the fact that we can get Peter Jan at almost dog odds right now is kind of mind blowing. And we're definitely looking to play him. Absolutely. Dude. This is, uh, I could talk about it for days. This is the most exciting fight on the card for me and most anticipated uh, title fight for me this year. These guys have been going back and forth on social media, and it almost kind of seems like the people's main event. It's kind of taken over, you know, Izzy and Jan a little bit. Peter Jan, he's, man, I, I feel good about it because he's been that guy that I have been, you know, so high on since getting signed to the UFC. I've been following him for so long. Um, 
and the UFC is high on this guy. You know, they've given him some favorable matchups. But not only that, this will be his third pay-per-view of three title fights. So, you know, UFC puts him on big cards to get him some attention. The wait for this one was because, you know, Tiger Muay Thai has closed and Peter Yan, you know, with the lockdown with COVID, needed to find a place to train and stuff. And what better camp for a Bantamweight than American top team? You know, it is filled with bodies in the room that are going to offer you great looks. Um, he's 7-0 and in the UFC. He captured the UFC belt in just over two years. Some of the best hands in the UFC, a piston of a left hand. And he knows how to hide his kicks behind his punches super well. And, you know, you mentioned the Uriah Faber when he throws his hand up. That combo, dude, he switches stances mid-combo and stuff. He's, his striking is on another level than Aljo's. He is heavy on that lead leg, and that's something Al, Aldo took advantage of. And, you know, with Sterling, uh, like him to keep the fight at range, I see him trying to take a book out of that and try to, you know, tear up the lead leg a little bit. He has uh, looked good after getting KO'd by Marlon Marais. He's pieced together five good wins with the most impressive one being, you know, the flawless performance over Sandhagen, which looks even better, you know, as Sandhagen continues to perform the way he does. Sterling does train out of Sarah BJJ. He trained with Marab, Aliquinta, Weidman, guys like that. It's a wrestling heavy gym. And, you know, he's been open about it, but it was no shock what kind of game plan he's coming into it. But, I'm really curious to see how that grappling is going to play out because if Jan can stuff a couple of them, I, I hope he tortures Al Jermaine in there. Um, at pick em odds, almost dog odds for Peter Mian, expect a couple units to be dropped there. Uh, 100%. Our second title bout of the evening takes us to the 145 women's division where we see the Lioness, Amanda Nunez, who's 20-4, and four, taking on Megan Anderson, who's 10-4. and four. Uh, Amanda Nunez, yep. the female goat without question. No question. Uh, she's made easy work of both the women's bantamweight and featherweight division since her loss to Kat Zinganu. Uh, really hasn't even had a competitive fight since then. Um, she's the only girl to, to win against Shevchenko inside the UFC, and she's done that twice. Yeah. Uh, she head kicked Holly Holm and knocked her out. Like, you know, in my opinion, Holly Holm's the best female striker mm -hmm. that there is. And Amanda Nunez goes out there and outstrikes her. Uh, she, you know, she doesn't just throw like any other girl. Like she fights Cyborg mm -hmm. and she makes Cyborg strikes look labored. Mm -hmm. You know, Amanda Nunez, she, she, she throws like a man. Throws heat. Throws heat. She throws absolute heat, and I sure as hell wouldn't want to step in the octagon across yeah. from her. Megan Anderson, not very many girls that are over six foot yeah. tall. Uh, she really is an anomaly of a human, mm -hmm. um, which which does make it interesting that she's the, you know, anywhere from plus 700 to plus 880 right now at, at FanDuel. I, um, I personally don't think that any girl mm – -hmm. um, or anybody in MMA should be a minus 1200 against anybody, whether it's the, you know, Chito Vera, Sean O'Malley instance mm -hmm. where somebody just a fluke happens at minus uh, a plus 880. It's almost just worth it to take it that something happens, whether it be a DQ win or Amanda Nunez hurt herself, uh, you know, mid fight. Megan Anderson, I'm not just going to I'm not just going to say that her only chance of winning is by a fluke. Mm -hmm. She does have some offensive abilities that that could give Amanda Nunez some trouble, specifically her knees up the middle, which we saw mm -hmm. uh, Jermaine Duranda may have some success with yeah. against Nunez. And I could see Anderson attempting to go to that. Um, but realistically, I think that Nunez will probably look to take this to the ground and, and implement her game plan. But at, at minus 1,200, Amanda's her own worst enemy here. Uh, all the pressure's on her and, you know, being a new mom, uh, I got to think that she's at a different mindset coming into this fight, which makes me think that it would be silly to pass up an Anderson bet. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there's no questions that she's the women's, ban or women's goat, period. And it's, it's crazy to look back to see her as like a plus 250 dog against Rousey, Tate, and Cyborg. Um, and even Sarah McMahon, all who she, she, you know, she finished every single one of them there um, and touched Valentina twice, um, you know, the pound for pound second best girl fighter. Mm -hmm. um, she has become a mom there. And, you know, granted, it probably takes time away from the training, but you got to think of it's more of a, um, a worry with Nina and her upcoming fight with, um, with Mackenzie Dern there. Amanda Nunes, I, I really compare her to Max Holloway. She has a perfect way of keeping you right on the tail end of her punches, and she offers, um, you know, an unreal amount of volume that really, you know, overwhelms a lot of girls. She has a good calf kick as well, and when that girl smells blood, 
She's a lioness, man. She goes for the absolute kill. What I love about her is her last eight fights have been scheduled for five rounds, and she's seen the fight, whole five rounds the last two times. You can't expect cardio to be an issue with this woman. And she's beaten both Felicia Spencer and Holly, who, Holly Holm, who we've seen beat Megan Anderson. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, doesn't always add up math-wise, but, you know, there's evidence that Amanda Nunes is the much better fighter here. Anderson, though, like you said, man, fucking mountain of a woman and signed for this particular reason right here to fight um, girls like Amanda Nunes mm-hmm. to wish they would have got the cyborg fight though. You know, it took a little bit longer than they, than they thought, but that's what she was signed for here. Her, her resume is padded with soccer moms and yoga pants and stuff like that. And she's getting a title win or a title shot off two wins over Zara Fiern and Norma Dumont. Like, I mean, you know, don't hate on Peter Yan getting a title shot, you know? Right. Um, you know, she she does offer some stuff that Amanda Nunez really will have to worry about with, um, you know, the size that she's going to have in there. But her ground game is still very much developing. She was subbed easily by Spencer and Cindy Dandawas of this girl who was, you know, did not have a good run in the UFC here. But I'd be lying if I said it's not, you know, not tempting to play Megan at these odds and probably something that, shit, if it's a point one unit, you know, you're winning almost a unit there, man. Um, Amanda Nunes doesn't really offer much, even in parlays or anything. Um, and if you're not betting the dog here, it has to be a complete pass probably. Look, as we think about it, I think that we could probably even beef up the Anderson play by just taking her inside the distance. Yeah. It's not that, like I said, it's like we don't really see that getting done, but it's just it's worth it for those odds. And, you know, Megan Anderson, she showed in that in her last fight, she has the knockout ability. Yeah. Yeah. And if Amanda Nunez is going to sit in there and trade with a six-foot girl, uh, crazier things have happened, I guess. And we've seen – time and time again minus 1200 women's mmas not pan out most profitable thing in 2020 no. so uh probably see a, a slight play there for us okay <laughs> headlining the main uh, the possibly the biggest card of the year is the 205 pound championship fight between jan blakovitz who's 27 and 8 versus the last style bender israel adesanya who's a perfect 20 and 0 I think that Izzy has clearly distanced himself as the best striker in the UFC. Um, Every question that he's ever got about his, you know, uh, grappling defense or if he's going to be able to compete in a sport that's uh, been grappling ran for Mm -hmm. quite a while. And he's answered all those questions. I mean, Izzy has proved time and time again that he does have the skill set to ward off any takedown attempts and, utilize his superior striking to get his to get the fight where he needs it to be that being said he's a he's a 185er true i mean all the way through he's a 185er yeah boy's not even weighing in at the weight limit at at 185 and now he's moving up you know izzy's really been comfortable averaging a seven inch reach advantage over his last four opponents Mm -hmm. and now he's finally got a guy who Although he is, he still has a reach advantage over matches him yeah. size wise. Um, is he's always really been good at like playing his striking game, like a chess match where he's constantly baiting his opponents and setting those traps. And, and he's always like, you know, a couple steps ahead of them. And I, I think that he could find success with somebody like Blakovic if Blakovic chooses to keep this on the mm-hmm. feet, which I don't think that he's going to do. Um, you know, he's known for his Polish power, which after his last fight against uh, or last two fights against Corey Anderson and Dominic Reyes, um, you, you kind of automatically assume that it's his KO power. But I really just think it's his raw Polish strength. Mm-hmm. You know, we see in some of the grappling exchanges that Blakowicz has been in, um, not necessarily being the most technical of fighters, but really just being able to muscle muscle his opponents mm-hmm. to the ground and not not even get uh crude i guess is yeah. the is the choice of words that mm-hmm. i'd use for some of his submissions where you see at the devin clark fight a standing kind of rear naked choke and then a side choke on nikita krilov yeah. really you know if if he can get his his hands on israel adesanya i do think that this could be a, a quick night for yan blakovitz but that's a tall, tall task that nobody else in Izzy's uh, past has been able to do. I uh, I think Jan's 
live. You know, I, I think he's live. I'm willing to accept that Izzy's the A side in this mm-hmm. fight, but I do think that Jan um, has some paths to victory. What do you think? Yeah, man, I'm with you. It's a, it's a really tricky fight, and, and Israel is my dude, and it's a fight that I'm probably going to be laying off here. Um, Blockowitz kind of had a little bit of a career resurgence, man, capturing this light heavyweight belt. He's been counted out time and time again, I think, closing as the favorite just one time in his 11 fights. Um, and that being the Ronaldo Souza fight, another middleweight trying to come up. You know, that makes two middleweights uh, in Souza and Rockhold. He's dispatched trying to come up to the division. So this is nothing really new for him here. And, you know, on the embeddeds and everything, uh, he's not just visiting the damn, the dead man's rope, man. He's got a bracelet with it now. Mm-hmm. That's uh, that's something crazy. This, this guy is really disciplined in his striking because you don't see him, um, you know, he'll throw the looping upper uppercuts and stuff like that to start some of his combinations, but he doesn't have to, um, to land one of those big shots to put you away. He's got raw power on the feet and he, um, you know, the body kick is something that he's leaned on a bunch, finishing Latifi with it. And I mean, murdering Dominic Reyes with it. He, um, he's real heavy on that lead leg. And that's why I keep going back to the coast of fightings because, you know, he, he really, um, if he's willing to play the, the distance fighting with Israel, I think that's going to cause him a lot of trouble Israel is, you know, one of mine and my wife's favorite fighters after witnessing, you know, him and Kelvin Gastelum fight there. And Izzy's looking to become the fifth simultaneous two-division champ the UFC has had. Proven top five pound-for-pound fighter. He capturing his middleweight belt in 14 months. Has to be some type of record there. He's, and he's been one of the more active champions that we've seen as well. He is the last of our city kickboxing guys to compete on Saturday. And, you know, outside of Volkanovski, definitely the more popular of the of them there um he's just one of those guys like we talked about with wonder boy and you know if, you know i'm sure we could rattle off some others there um you can't strike with him um and, and expect your night to end well he throws so many great feints at you he loves his jab and that left hook spelled in for both whitaker and costa um he just gives you way too much to think about on the feet and he really does beat you up both to the body the legs and he gets you behind on points that way you have to come forward and make some of those mistakes and I see that kind of being the downfall of Blockowitz here is getting behind on points and, and kind of having to rush forward and might have a slip up there against Israel, who's a much superior striker. Um, how do you see Blockowitz having any issues here? Yeah, Blockowitz, you know, after doing a little bit of that tape study, he does have some glaring holes in his stand-up. You know, something that he does is he bites on feints really hard, and he'll actually even give you like an over-exaggerated, you know, movement to show you how he plans on defending that that feint that you yeah. throw. I think Izzy being just that high level of striker will constantly set those traps. And even if he's not going to exploit them early, um, he's, he's planning on exploiting them later on whenever Jan does get frustrated. Like we saw in the Tiago Santos fight, um, maybe just a little bit of frustration. And, and then, you know, he gets, he gets Santos in a, a favorable position mm-hmm. and, and bum rushes him a little yeah. bit. And Izzy's really, really good um, striking off of his back yeah. foot and backing up. And Jan Blakovic, you know, like I said, in that Tiago Santos fight, we've seen him get caught coming in. And that's definitely something that I worry about with Israel Adesanya. I do think that if Izzy can avoid that takedown early, um, it, it could be a, a pretty easy night. Mm-hmm. And one where, where I could see him outpoint Blakovic, but, you know, Blakovic sitting at plus 190 right now. I, I highly doubt that he's going to outpoint Izzy. Right. So to, to beef it up a little bit, if I was playing Jan, which, I, you know, we might, we might mm-hmm. end up playing on, we got to play him inside the distance, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, the value was on Jan Blockwitz inside the distance here. Um, like I said, spilled the night for two middleweights already, you know, trying to move up and make that move to the light heavyweight division. Um, and Israel, you know, I know he's the best striker, but he's definitely the smaller of the two middleweights that have come up already. Um, yeah, if Blockwitz gets this done, it's by it, it's not over in the judges' scorecard. You're not out striking a technical striker in Izzy. It, it's probably going to be by getting this fight on the mat, and using his strength, and um, you know just raw power to finish that as well. So a slight stab on Jan Blockwitz, but for me, uh, probably going to be just you know a pass personally and just sit back and enjoy this one because. It's a tricky fight, man. You don't want to stand with Israel, but he's got his hands full in Blockowitz. The more that we talk about it, the more I do think Izzy's probably just the straight-up A side. And you mentioned that we would be able to just kick back and enjoy a fight. This would be one I really would be happy with just just having fun with right here. For sure, man. 
uh, finally concludes the 15 fight pay-per-view, man. Uh, I hope all these fights stay together. It will be an absolute treat come Saturday. If I look through this entire card here and had to pick out one fight that stands out for me, uh, it's going to be the Kyler Phillips and Song Yidong fight. You know, Yidong taking on four bonuses already in six fights, and Kyler Phillips averaging just under a six-minute fight time. Um, I know we looked at playing the under there possibly as well. It's going to be a fun fight, and even if it does go to the scorecards, it's, it's going to be a really back-and-forth close fight. Yeah, I like that one a lot, actually. It probably would have been mine mm-hmm. second to this one right here, mm-hmm. Tiago Santos versus Alexander Rakic. Yeah. We're high on Rockage, That's and we fair. know that Tiago Santos packs the power. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't see this one seeing the judges, and with two big 205ers, I, uh, I, I think that there'll be fireworks on yeah. Saturday. What a way to kick off the pay-per-view main card. Um, for me, if there is a fighter, it has got to be my boy Peter Jan. Um, get him at pick a mods, hopefully dog odds for the champ. I think this will be the first time – or no, I'm sorry, the third time since 2008 we've seen a champion come in at like underdog odds or mm-hmm. something. Mm-hmm. Very, very rare occurrence. And if I can get my boy Peter Jan at dog odds, be dropping a bunch of units there, I hope, for a stellar performance. Him, uh, I hope he puts Sterling out inside the distance there, man. I, I love that. Uh, mine's going to be for my girlfriend. She's a big Carlos Olberg <laughs> fan, so that'll definitely be who – all the eyes are on right. uh, Saturday night in our household. Absolutely, man. That concludes UFC 259. I'm trying to get out of this slump for 2021. If you're still with us, man, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel there. And again, on Spotify and Apple Music now, a couple different ways for you guys to check out the channel and stuff and hope y'all continue to make some money with us. Thanks for the support.